Okay. I guess we're live. Good. <laughs> All right. So at this point, I want to talk a little bit about <coughs> protein interaction networks, where we get the data from particularly. I've, I was trying to be more general in the first part, although I kept drifting into protein interaction networks, which is where we're going to be going for most of the rest of today. Um, <laughs> but I want to start by telling you a little about where the data come from and why we care and then talk about some function prediction approaches um, and <coughs> some of why we care about that as well and how we do that. So <coughs> specifically talking about protein interaction networks, right? So we've seen the proteins can bind to each other. <coughs> A lot of protein interaction, there are different kinds of protein interactions. So some of them will be sort of stable interactions that form part of a complex where a bunch of proteins get together and stay together and do something for a while. Others are more transient, and they tend to be involved in responding to particular um, <coughs> cellular situations or functions. So, aha. So for example, um, this is a signaling response to adrenal, uh, G protein signaling in response to adrenaline. So a receptor binds to that, <coughs> which in turn comes in, changes the, this is a G protein that's got two different subunits bound together. When this thing gets in there, changes the conformation of this, releases GDP, it attracts GTP, and that allows it to bind to something else and, and amplify that signal and pass that along in the cell. Right, so these are kind of transient interactions in response to a particular stimulus. And this is how the cell functions and passes information along and how it responds to things. Um, so we can actually move this. That works. Right, so <laughs> in this field, we really like to talk about protein interaction networks. And maybe the first question is, why do we care? Um, <laughs> Right? And the reason we care is because they can tell us about things <coughs> that we care about. Right? We care about protein function. We care about protein function in particular. Well, I don't know. I do a lot of work in humans, so I care about when proteins are functioning properly and when they're not and how that leads to disease. Um, if we know about function, we can begin to, to, and how it relates to disease, we can begin to suggest avenues for developing new therapeutics, new treatments. I actually worked for the pharmaceutical company Wyeth for a bunch of years. So like I was intimately involved in trying to find intelligent and develop intelligent targeted therapies. Um, and of course, we can even try to infer what the interaction network looks like when we don't have raw data about that. Um, so basically, we get excited because we're, we're computer scientists, but we can use this to do biology um, and do med medical research. And in particular, we have lots of data to work with. And so this gives us <laughs> the ability to do things. So I put this picture up because I think of protein interaction networks as really a bridge between sort of computational models and function. <laughs> and we're going to be spending some time on that bridge looking at how to get there. Um, and of course, I have to pick this bridge because we're here. <laughs> right. So there are a lot of different methods now um, for generating high throughput protein interaction data. And I'm going to just talk about a couple of them. You know, Looking last week at what's been done since most of the big papers came out, there are 15 new methods, all of which are variations on a theme. Um, but the bulk of the data, I think, is still from these two or families of approaches, I should say. And this is sort of a nice temporal model of where big data sets of different organisms, and you can see funny-looking humans and funny-looking mice came out over time. Um, it needs to be updated now, but <laughs> it gives you a sense of like growing data sets. And the size of the data sets are log scale on the uh, y-axis. Right. So briefly, <laughs> the basic idea of yeast to hybrid assays um, is to use the cell's own machinery to tell you about protein interactions, its own transcriptional machinery. And so the idea is we build a construct. We have a, um, a DNA binding domain. Oh, that is not what I wanted. So we have a DNA binding domain here. 
Um, and in order to transcribe this particular gene, we need the DNA binding domain and the DNA activation domain, transcriptional activation domain to be in close proximity to each other. So we create a bait fusion protein that has the pro one of the proteins whose interactions we want to study, the, which we call the bait, or X. We fuse that to this DNA binding domain. And then we fuse an activation domain to candidate interactors, which we'll call Y, and we call that the prey. Um, <laughs> And when X and Y bind to each other, if they are able to bind to each other, we get transcription. Basically, the activation domain recruits RNA polymerase II, and we get transcription of a reporter gene. This is usually LACZ or something where you can actually look at it and see a color change um, indicating that you've got transcription. <laughs> right, so this is a, a bait and prey system where you can look for pairwise interactions. And <laughs> so this is something that scales up very nicely. Um, <laughs> One of the advantages of this is that because you can do it in a cellular context and you can do it, you can use it to capture potential interactions that may not occur all the time. Um, you can put two proteins together and if they are, you know, have sufficient affinity for each other and the conditions are right, they will bind to each other. And you'll see this even if it's something that you would normally have to look, you know, in vivo at a lot of different conditions for. Um, they're nice binary interactions, so if we like our graph formalism, then this is a good fit for that. Uh, and you know, it's very scalable. But it does have a number of drawbacks. Right? So we do this in a, a very controlled cellular environment. It's not necessarily in cells from the organism you care about. In fact, it's a yeast cell, kind of, regardless of what you're looking at. Um, <laughs> And so it doesn't have the contextual signals that say this interaction should occur, right? If it's an interaction that signals um, response to adrenaline, right, we're not in a condition where we're responding to adrenaline. And so some of the other things that may be going on in your cellular context are missing. Um, the big one really is that <laughs> just because I can put two proteins together and force them to bind to each other in this assay does not mean that they are ever made at the same time in the same part of the cell in real life. Right, so we get lots of false positives from things that could interact but don't. <laughs> um, and we get false negatives from other interactions. Right, so they're, they're, they can miss things. Um, you don't see complexes, groups of proteins that may be binding together. Right? What if you get, you know, protein A can only bind to proteins B and C together? You're not going to see that. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of noise in these things. And it also actually depends on who you choose as the bait and who you choose as the prey as to which, direct, which kinds of noise you get. And so there's you know, higher confidence in an interaction where you've seen it from both directions than if you've seen it from just one direction. Um, right, so <laughs> other approaches that use something related to immunoprecipitation or a wider family of things that I'll just call affinity and pull down methods um, that are, you know, there, there are a number of different ways of doing this, but they're all sort of variations on the following theme, where we have, in this case, an antibody, right? So basic immunoprecipitation, we have an antibody uh, that binds to an antigen, a particular protein, and if we can use some kind of tag to identify this antibody and pull it out, um, and then break break those bonds and break them apart, we can try and figure out what this protein is. So in co-IP, which is really what we use for fine interactions, we do the same thing uh, with a target protein, like an, an antigen, and a complex that it's part of. And we can put this into a cellular context, and it pulls down the protein complex. And then we break this apart, and we actually use mass spec or some variant on it um, to try to identify what the component proteins in that complex are. Right, so we break them apart into different, uh, in, into their individual components, and then we get a spectral analysis of what they look like, and mass and charge, and we try to figure out what we've got. So again, this has sort of different, inter uh, different advantages. In particular, it's designed to pull out complexes. Right, and all of these approaches will get things, <laughs> a whole bunch of proteins bound together. Um, you get more context, because you can work in the original context. And if you want to, again, if you want to increase reliability, you can use different proteins as the antigen or the bait in this case. Um, but you're still missing stuff. 
<coughs> right, so now it's because we're looking at what's present in a particular time, we have the problem we had before where the transient interactions we might not see. Um, the tags that we need to produce in some form to pull the antibodies out can potentially interfere with complex formation or binding, <laughs> right? So we get false negatives, um, we get false positives, and we're not, you know, mass spec is really good, but it's not perfect, right? So we may not actually recognize what is in our soup of proteins that, that bound together initially accurately. Um, and we also have a problem of interpretation. So all we get out from the picture of a protein complex is here are the components of the protein complex. So now that we're trying to build our binary representation, we have a couple of options, right? So here's my, my betas in blue and my prey are in lighter blue. Um, how do we want to represent it? I have a whole bunch of con players. So I can do a sort of spoke model where I have connections to pairwise connections to each individual player, but they don't talk to each other. Or I could do something that gives you a complete graph. And I don't know that either of those is right, and probably the right answer is somewhere in between. Right, so we're working with extremely noisy data <laughs> under the best of circumstances. Um, I'm going to talk about most of just this. I'm not going to go into detail about how we infer these. but. <laughs> So experimentally, we'd still like to be able to identify a larger range of protein-protein interactions than we've actually got from high-throughput experiments where people did these kinds of things. Um, and there are lots of ways of doing this. One of the best sources of data on really everything in biology is the biomedical literature. <laughs> right, so you'd say, okay, this is great. People have done a study that actually demonstrated, not in a high throughput assay, but in, you know, a mouse, that protein A does really in vivo interact with protein B. That's great data, and that's reliable data. Um, but capturing that through text mining is painful. And let me just point out that um, I've done a little bit of work in the field of biomedical text mining. The problem of figuring out where in even in just an abstract of a paper, somebody is referring to a protein, and what protein they're talking about is really, really hard. And we have contests, like there's the biocreative contest to figure out if you can do this better than other people. And it's, it's you know, we can get a certain percentage of the way there, but that last 20, 30% um, <laughs> is really hard, complicated by the fact that some communities, like the fruit fly people, give their proteins really silly names. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, you know, and there, there are names that could be English words that would be perfectly normal in text. So it's really hard to figure some of this out. Um, a great way of doing this is structural, right? So if you actually have 3D structure of two proteins, you can start to make predictions about how they might bind to each other. Um, and this is potentially effective, but it's actually hard, right? First of all, because we don't have the solve structures of most proteins and our ability to predict structure is another one of these hard problems that's kind of plateauing not quite all the way we need to be to the solution. Um, and partially because we just don't do a great job of predicting interaction from structure, but we're, you know, so if, if you have good structures, you can try to do this. We do it with moderate accuracy. Um, Co-expression, I hate to have to put this on here, but a lot of the databases predict that two proteins interact if they are expressed in the same place. That is <laughs> really overly optimistic. If you have a very high threshold for co-expression, it might be reasonable. If you have a context-specific threshold for co-expression, it might be reasonable. Um, I tend to look for this data in large-scale data sets and filter it out or be very careful using it. Um, but <laughs> you really want to know if it's in there. Uh, and then there's the question of predicting interactions from sequence homology. So this is getting back to what we were talking about. Of, okay, we have a, an evolutionary process. You duplicate some proteins, and maybe it diverges over time. But can't you just assume that if you know the proteins were homologous in the previous organism and the ancestral organism, they're, then they're interacting with each other now, <laughs> right? And so this is this concept called interlogs. Um, so basically. Briefly speaking, if we have two proteins that were derived from a common ancestor, then we say they're orthologous. Um, and right, so now we have you know, modern species A and B, 
we have the same, the same gene or the same protein, and they derive from a common ancestor. So we'll call them orthologs. Right, so suppose we have two pairs of orthologs, gene one and gene two, in these different species. And we know that protein in, in species A, these proteins interact. Can we just assume that they interact in species B? And if we can, we would call them interologs. I don't know. This is the omicizing of the English language or something. So can we assume interologs are there? <coughs> the answer is yeah, maybe. <laughs> Um, so, yes, sometimes, but much less than you'd think, right? This is actually a paper of Burkhard Rust from a number of years ago, but there's a lot of supporting data as well from other people. Um, not as much as you'd think. And the conservation of interaction is proportional to how similar the sequences of these orthologs and these orthologs are, and they have to be really highly similar. So forget like vague structural similarity. They have to be quite highly conserved before you can conclude that you can map this interaction to this species with any confidence. Um, and they also argued that with <laughs> duplications, you can, you can do this better within a species than across species, like the threshold, you can, you can take a lower threshold for sequence similarity and believe that the interaction still holds if you're in the same species. But once you're in a new organism, there's too much other stuff going on, basically, that interferes with it. And so you need a much higher threshold for sequence similarity to believe that interlogs are real. Um, so this is just <laughs> something you need to <laughs> be aware of, is that you know people do this, but <laughs> you've got to be careful about it. But you know, you can also look at larger things, and I'll let Rodet talk about this kind of stuff. But if you look at wider neighborhoods than just the immediate structure of a pairwise interaction, you may be able to recover some information uh, that lets you predict <laughs> other interactions. <laughs> the other thing to notice is that um, degree correlation is not great. Right? So even if you have orthologs, <laughs> two orthologs uh, in different species, the correlation of their degrees is kind of, you know, nu numerically is kind of low. Um, <laughs> but it still turns out that if we have hubs that have important regulatory functions, highly connected nodes, even though there isn't a direct, you don't see a line out here, um, but as a proportion of, so this is just correlation of degree of homologous nodes in two species, I think it's fly and worm, but I've, all of the plots pretty much look like this. Um, you can still <laughs> find that they're likely to be highly connected, but individual connections will get gained and lost all over the place. Um, so, So, right, so part of the question is if you do this as a proportion of the total number of edges you know, you, it still kind of looks like this, but you get a little bit more uh, conservation up out in the area that you, where you'd expect correlation. So, yes, it does, it, yes, the missing data thing rears its head again, right? And, um, and you want to, we were trying to pick at the time the networks that we had the best data for, but you're right, we're, they're all incomplete, and they're incomplete in different ways. Right, so where do you get this data from? I felt like I should mention there are a whole bunch of databases. Mostly I just wanted to put some of them on a slide. So if you're looking at this later and you want to go get some data, you have some starting points for where to look. Um, and the other question is where, <laughs> where do you find data about exactly the kinds of things you're talking about? Right, so there's noise, there's, <laughs> well, missing data. Um, and people have looked at false positive and false negative rates. The upshot is they're high, but they're variable from data set to data set and from person assessing it to person assessing it. And so it depends on how you exactly measure. Uh, and I don't have a particular method that I'm going to promote here. But <laughs> most of the people doing the experiments can at least give you something of an assessment of how, how much they believe that particular interaction occurs. And so the, most of the databases now will collect confidence scores on individual uh, edges. 
And those are useful things to, to have. And if you have a whole bunch of people who predict the same interaction with probability 0.8 or something, then maybe its cumulative probability goes up. Right? So you can begin to get better, better reliability. <laughs> um, and you're right. This is the question you were asking, is what about all the stuff that's missing? So here is a protein interaction network neighborhood of a particular node. Um, and confidence scores on the edges. And this isn't really the picture when you, when you view a graph like this. You're really talking about this graph. right? It's a complete graph with nodes that you didn't know about and edges that you didn't know about. And you don't know what the probabilities are on those, except that either they haven't been assayed yet, or they have been, but they didn't work. Or maybe they, maybe they have been, and they predicted no interaction, and that's correct. And you, don't, you need to come up with some estimate for what the probabilities are for all those other edges. So they have to kind of be in the back of your mind when you're thinking about these graphs. Um, I do see a lot of papers submitted where people just don't think about confidence. They don't think about reliability. They don't think about missing data. And they, those papers don't tend to get very far. So, um, and they don't tend to have realistic conclusions. The, Other thing I just wanted to mention again briefly is that sometimes you can get useful information by visualizing parts of the network. Um, doing this is hard. <laughs> A lot of people in our community like to use Cytoscape, which is you know, some trades open source tool that has begun, become much bigger than that, um, and that has a lot of support built in for biomedical networks in particular. Um, Gephi is getting very popular as a network visualization tool I'm seeing in a number of papers uh, and is more generally sort of aimed at the, the you know, graphs and networks community and all around. It has a lot of nice built-in functions. Um, but neither of these do a great job of visualizing large protein interaction networks, which typically look like this. Uh, and this has become such a uh, joke that, in fact, people make fun of it. So here's the ISM bingo card. Uh, and one of the points is for a talk that has a ridiculous grammar, confuse a grammar. In other words, one of those graphs of protein interaction networks. So try to be careful when you're working with these. Like visualization is useful for your own purposes, but putting up pictures of stars is not helpful. All right. Yeah, the card is really good. I have the rest of it if people want it. All right. So now I want to talk a little, change gears and talk about how we get function out of all of this. And the first question about that is really what is, how do we know about function? Right? How do, right? So genes and proteins do things. How do we know that? Somebody does an experiment. Right? Somebody does something in cells or to yeast, and they write about it. Um, they write about it in natural language. And all of a sudden, we're back to this problem I mentioned earlier, which is that you know, natural language processing is a hard subfield of computer science that probably not that many of us work in. Um, <coughs> some of us may. And biomedical natural language processing is a harder subfield <laughs> of science, or at least it's, it's a specific one. Right? So a lot of the general natural language processors that are trained on corpora from the Wall Street Journal do a really dismal job reading biomedical papers. And I'm sure any of you who have spent five minutes with PubMed will understand why. Right? The, the use of language is very, very different. Um, not just because we can't find the proteins or the gene names, but we can't find the interaction types, we can't find the experimental evidence, we can't find the regulator not, which is three sentences back, <laughs> um, and kind of important if we're saying these things do perform a function or do not perform a function. Um, so we have, we have a hard time getting this information automatically. But we, if we want to do anything about function prediction that uses a computer, we need representation of protein function that computers can deal with. And free text isn't it. So we actually need a dictionary that characterizes protein function in some canonical way. Um, <coughs> and probably the best known and best used and you know, maybe most solid of these is the gene ontology. Um, <laughs> And this is basically an organization of 
people who recognized this problem 15 years ago and said, you know, we really need to do something about standardizing functional annotation for genes and gene products across organisms and in a way that can be computationally useful. Um, so the annotation, there's actually an ontology that they've developed that's continually evolving. Um, it's uh, represented as a directed acyclic graph, so terms, you know, there are more general terms at the top and more specific terms at the bottom, and you can, they can inherit from multiple parents if there are, there are sort of examples of, actually, so there are colors of edges basically saying, are they examples of, are they regulated by, are they doing, you know, what, are they part of a process? Um, and there actually are three ontologies, really. So one that captures what they call biological processes, like you know, develop, four limb development, um, one that captures molecular function, often enzymatic function, and one that's really based on where in the cell things are, and that sometimes is a clue to what they're doing, right? So a lot of the annotations are actually in this cellular component ontology, like we know that this is a membrane protein because it has a structural motif that makes you think it's a membrane protein, we have no idea what it does. <laughs> right, so that's, that's a good chunk of what's in there. Um, but there's, of course, a lot of more functionally specific data. <laughs> um, and again, this is because this is designed to be standardized, there's information about it. So basically, this data comes from papers. And it comes from somebody doing an experiment, writing a paper, somebody else reading it, or in some cases, computationally assisted reading it. Um, computer says, read this, but a human usually checks it. There's, there is an evidence code for just computationally inferred evidence, and most people are wary about using that because that's pretty noisy because we don't do natural language well and we don't do, you know, co-expression doesn't mean that something does, you know, so the conclusions are more likely to be wrong in those cases. Um, <laughs> for those of you who are PIs here who know about the gene ontology and can't imagine life without it, their grant is up for renewal. If you had time in the next couple of days to write a support letter, if you can't imagine them not getting funding again, uh, then talk to me, because um, <laughs> they're collecting letters. And uh, this is a good thing to do. Uh, disclosure is I'm on the scientific advisory board of the GO now. So, um, <laughs> so they do a lot of different species, and one of the things you'll notice is that right, they, they distinguish between experimentally derived and computationally derived stuff, um, and are represented in many species, especially model organisms like mouse and rat, uh, and some of the others that were in, you know, fly and worm and zebrafish are also very actively involved. So when we talk about functional annotations in Go, we can say, do two proteins have the same annotation term? But now we're getting into trouble again, because let's see, if I go back here, and I'm a curator, right? There are actually curators who read papers and decide, OK, this paper is supporting, with this kind of evidence, the claim that this protein is involved in positive regulation of a MAP kinase activity. But that human is making a decision, and maybe they just called it regulation of MAP kinase, or maybe they called it MAP kinase activity, and maybe they didn't get as specific, and another person would get a little more specific. They try to minimize variation, but you know, they, there's still a lot of it. Um, so maybe you don't really want to say, do proteins have exactly the same term? Maybe you want to look at similarity of terms. And so then we start looking at distances in the gene ontology to even talk about similarity. And you could just look at distances in the graph, right? We have a directed acyclic graph. You can compute <laughs> distance um, if you assume that the edges are undirected because you're going to have to go up and down, right? Or maybe just the sum of distances to a common ancestor, right? So from a common ancestor. But what's typically done is this semantic similarity thing, <laughs> right? So this is actually kind of nice because it's looking at <laughs> more, it, it's basically saying if two, two uh, functional terms have as their common ancestor something really high up the tree, like cellular process that's not very informative, I don't care that much, right? But if they have something that's pretty low down and, and, and meaningful, that's a lot more interesting. And so by meaningful, I'm going to just take the negative log of the probability of seeing that term, right? So that I can, <laughs> um, you know, common terms 
I'm going to see all the time. Right? And so they're going to take, for any two terms, uh, C1 and C2, we're going to look at all the common ancestors. Right? So we could go, if we were up here, we could go up the tree some, or up the dag, uh, and find additional common ancestors. And of those, what's the least likely one? Let's take negative log of its probability. Right, so that's how we assess semantic similarity. Um, and we do this with, I mean, you can do this with any source of functional annotation. There are a number of hierarchical <coughs> methods like this. MIPS has its own version of it. There are, no, there are other ones, um, <coughs> the organism-specific databases. We also get a lot of pathway data from pathway databases, like the BioPsych collection of pathway databases or the KEG collection of pathways. Um, so people use that to some degree as well. <laughs> Those are not typically as hierarchically organized, but some things are. Um, but we still don't know protein function, right? So all of this, you know, I sort of, <laughs> about something like a third of the, unipro pro of the human proteins in Unipro don't have any experimentally derived annotation in the geontology. They have a couple of... Uh, computational things. There are if it, 10 to 15 percent of human proteins that even with all the computational inferences, we just have no, you know, we can, we can look at structure, we have no idea what they do. Um, so this isn't getting us far enough. <laughs> right, and you saw a little bit about using like things like profile HMMs to talk about what protein family something might be a good, rep you know, the most likely uh, hidden Markov model of a, of a protein family that fits the data for the sequence, but we, you know, you can still you can predict that something is DNA binding and still not know what its function is. Um, so this is where we started looking at protein interaction networks as a way of getting at uh, what proteins do. Right, and the basic idea behind this is really this sort of guilt by association concept. <clears throat> so this starts out by saying that if I don't know the function of a protein, but it's connected to a protein whose function I know, maybe I should assume that they do the same thing. <clears throat> right, that sounds very simplistic. <laughs> um, but in fact, that was sort of the whole, the whole basis of guilt by association is that, that claim. And this was the original uh, example in protein interaction network data. They've used this principle widely in other kinds of networks, um, where we had a protein where we knew that it was involved in arginine metabolism, and we had a couple of other proteins that were connected to each other but and to that protein, and we were able to make some validatable claims about their function based on that. Um, so that's well and good, and a lot of protein function prediction from protein interaction networks just relies on this principle of saying, okay, well, if I'm connected to you, then I must have your function, or maybe I have your function. <coughs> but that gets a little simplistic, um, and it isn't always true. So actually, there's a nice paper uh, by Gillis and Pavlidis that basically says guilt by association <laughs> has worked for us because we're assessing a biased subset of the graph. Um, <laughs> but it's subject to all sorts of problems, right? So, so their examples look kind of, I, I abstracted away and simplified their examples a little bit. But um, so you can imagine versions with more edges. But the basic idea is suppose we're trying to predict the, the function of this guy as, and this, this gets generalized to basically majority of the functions of the neighbors, right? So you look at your whole neighborhood of all of the proteins you're connected to, um, and you vote that you're going to have the function that the majority of them have, right? So suppose that we're going to predict a function, and our functions are either green or orange. Um, <laughs> so we're going to just predict a color of neighbor, and we don't know anything about the function of this protein, so we want to predict it. Well, if we happen to have this edge, then we're going to predict orange. But if we happen to be missing this edge, which we are with some substantial probability based on where the data are coming from and the fact that all of these things are incomplete, we're going to not make that prediction that this is orange when maybe we should. Right? And similarly, suppose we have this orange, but we're trying to predict the uh, function of this protein. <laughs> 
right? Well, maybe this is a green protein, and it's connected to a green protein and an orange protein, so we would be not sure which, which color we should predict, but maybe we're missing this, data, this edge, right? And then we're going to make a mistake. We're going to say, oh, this is an orange protein. We're going to get it wrong, <laughs> right? So we get false positives and false negatives from doing this. And so um, the argument is that basically there are certain edges that are really important in this network for function prediction and that we've disproportionately biased our uh, protein interaction assays towards those edges, <laughs> right? We care about important proteins. We care about hub proteins. We look at their connections. They're more likely to have other neighbors who are in a complex with them. Um, so that there's some bias here that, it, again, this is another one of these examples of noise where it's kind of hard to model the noise exactly, but we know that there is some bias. Um, and you can argue, you know, people do try to model it, right? People try to say, okay, here's a model of <laughs> what the bias looks like. What does that do to our graphs? And some of, some of these arguments are based on, on you know, studies like that. Okay. So you can be smarter about guilt by association, too. <laughs> um, one of the things you can look at is, again, functional similarity. So you don't have to get the exact same term. You can get an approximate term. And uh, <laughs> it was shown that the closer you are in the network, the more semantic similarity there is between the annotations that have been applied to proteins. <laughs> um, and you can be a little deeper about that still. Right? So you can look at the network neighborhood <laughs> in general. Look at the whole network neighborhood. <laughs> um, here I colored these by how far out they are. Uh, so let's suppose that <laughs> I want to look at everything that's within three hops from my protein, my red protein in the center, and I'm going to call that my neighborhood, right? So you can do neighborhood-based prediction. Um, <laughs> there was a neighborhood counting method that was one of the early methods proposed where you could just basically look at uh, the function, so let's look at the functions of all of the things in my network neighborhood for some neighborhood distance radius of size k, right? So maybe it's just the, the orange ones that are within distance one or the orange and yellow ones in distance two or all three. And then I'm going to count for all of those how many of my neighbors have each annotation term. So five of my neighbors have mTOR signaling as an annotation term. Five of them say DNA damage checkpoint. You know, three of them say nuclear division, and so on. And I'm going to rank these and then predict the top three functions. I don't know how they picked three. And I do know how they picked k, um, which is that they tried a whole bunch of k and took the best of them, uh, which isn't <laughs> really an ideal way of doing it. But um, so you can do a pretty good job of getting functions right by looking at something like this. But again, if you do cross-validation or withhold known annotations, you get some things wrong. And of course, some of your predictions may be correct, and you may just not know it. Right? So unless you can actually go back and do experimental assays to confirm unvalidated predictions, you're not actually going to know if you're right in some of these cases. Um, <laughs> I mean, one thing you can do is you, you could use an old version of the functional annotation and compare it to a new one and see if you get new things correct, right? So you can, you can go and download Go from a particular date or a particular version and try that. <coughs> um, so one of the issues with all of this is that the terms that tend to be most common Right, and maybe I need to go find a slide that shows the gag for a minute. Um, but the terms that tend to be the most common tend to be these terms at the top of the ontology. And they also tend to be not very informative terms. Right? They tend to be things like developmental process or cellular process or biochemical function or something. <laughs> 
right? So we tend to have annotations that don't mean a lot. And so we'd like to actually do something <laughs> statistical to say, let's focus on the ones that are interesting and meaningful and you know, unexpected. <laughs> right? So this, one of the earliest examples of that was looking at um, sort of a chi-squared computation for likelihood of seeing an annotation term. So for each term, um, <laughs> you can compute the chi-squared value as being, <laughs> so let's say you have a certain number of neighbors of distance k. Uh, you have ni neighbors. You can see what, <laughs> um, how many you would, ex how many you actually see with term i, and then you can say, well, okay, I have, I'm in here and I have six neighbors or seven neighbors, I guess, at distance one, and I'd expect only, you know, x percent of them to be, to have term i based on its frequency in the whole, whole set of annotated proteins. Right? And so you can compute observed versus expected and what's most like, likely to, what's, what's most surprising, basically. Um, and that did a, be a better job of, function prediction and also did a better job of getting terms out that were actually interesting and meaningful. Um, and again, this is a function of neighborhood size, right? So you could start with a neighborhood of size one, you could grow it to a neighborhood of, of you know, distance two or whatever. So one of the ones that I like that uses the local neighborhood structure but does a, a <coughs> more interesting job of it <coughs> um, is uh, Stan Lutovsky and Simon Kassif did something with um, Markov Random Fields. But basically it was it, 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 almost, it, it was simpler than a, than a full Markov Random Field model. It's basically just a probabilistic model of saying that you know, what, what is the probability of my neighbor having this particular uh, label, <laughs> of, of my having this particular label, given that I have a certain number of neighbors in, within distance k, <laughs> and some of them have, you know, some fraction, I'm sorry, so I shouldn't say distance k, distance d, and k of them have term t as their label. <laughs> right, so the idea here is that we're going to start with Right, if we know your label, then you have that term with probability one, and if you don't, then we uh, just use the background probability of your having that term. And then we iterate, we do sort of an, an expectation step where we basically use the expected probability of your having, of your having uh, that annotation given that all of your other neighbors have it or that, that this fraction of your neighbors have it. So they compute this probability, they do a nice sort of Bayesian formulation of it. And I was actually hoping I'd be able to go through that in more detail with you today, except that having gone through the paper in some detail in the last week or so, it's not very clearly specified exactly how it's computed. I believe that they did it right, <laughs> but it's the sort of thing that, uh, I think it, it's an ISMB paper from a, a number of years ago, and I think if they'd gone through two rounds of review, they would have put more details in the paper. <laughs> um, but the the basic concept of the model is pretty pretty clear, and the basic, you know, the idea of looking at this probability and then going a couple of steps out and saying, okay, let's all simultaneously assume that my neighbors are right, and now let's try and compute the probability of my having this label, and then let's do it again, now that I assume that my updated probabilities are correct, um, is sort of an, a, a typical HMM kind of approach. Their catch is they don't run it for too many steps, <laughs> because they're worried about herring off down wrong paths. So they, they limit the length of this rather, you know, the number of iterations rather severely. Um, but they do get exceptionally high precision, something on the order of 98% precision in cross-validation tests. Um, they get, the recall is limited, but again, you don't always know when you're, <laughs> when you're missing information. Okay. So the other family of approaches that are kind of interesting to think about are, are graph-theoretic approaches that look at cuts. So. Um, or max flow or min cut in the graph. Uh, one of, a number of them have come up with sort of variations on this idea of 
finding ways to partition the graph um, <laughs> such that you minimize the number of interactions that occur between proteins with different kinds of annotations. <laughs> right? And so you get uh, the, the general, I don't know, the generalized multi-cut problem, which I guess is, or, or minway multi-cut, which I guess is an NP-complete problem, but um, they find approximate algorithms that do a pretty good job of it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if they prove optimality bounds on those, but again, I, I worry frequently. So, like one of the themes that comes up in when I teach computational biology to students back home is that so many of the problems we want to solve are, have provable hardness results, <laughs> right? So a lot of the things we're dealing with are problems where we know we're unlikely to find, let's say, an, a polynomial time algorithm uh, for any of them. But we need to come up with something. And once you're in that space, well, OK, you can talk about approximation algorithms. But that's almost not enough, right? It's not enough for me to say I'm going to approximate Hamiltonian path within a factor of two, the optimal. It's, it, what's important for me is that does that give me the assembly of a, gra of, of a genome that bears any resemblance to the real thing, right? And so you've got to be very careful when you're doing these optimization problems that you're, you're optimizing the right thing and that approximately optimizing that thing is going to work. Um, and so here I think you have a natural way of testing it, which is that we're looking at predicting protein function for proteins that aren't annotated, and we can do that and, and you know, do some sort of cross-validation approach and look at how well we're doing it. Um, so we can assess how well we do. <laughs> and many of these approaches are pretty effective. Um, you can also look at, you know, again, these are sort of looking at how many immediate neighbors are connected so you can look at, <laughs> this is a flow problem as well. Uh, Mona Singh and some, some colleagues had took this approach a number of years ago where, I mean, their argument was really that if you're just looking at the neighborhood of protein A and you're looking at a neighborhood of size 2 or 2 hops away, then this neighborhood has three proteins with this dark annotation term. And the neighborhood of B also has, or sorry, of A here also has three proteins with the dark annotation term. But this one's a lot closer and much more likely to be of term of type B than, than you know, these guys over here might be doing something totally different. Right? So they used a flow model to basically capture the idea that, you know, it isn't just that there are three neighbors here, it's that they all have to go through this inflection point or this bottleneck to get there. And that structure somehow has meaning. Um, so specifically, they sort of said, well, okay, what if we have some, for each annotation term, we do this separately. We have a term over here uh, that's been annotated for each of these three proteins, and we don't know about these proteins. Um, what's the chance that these guys should have that annotation? Well, we're going to come up with a flow model based on, right, so they, the weights of the edges are either one or confidence scores of the interaction, so something less than one probabilities, <laughs> right? And you start out with infinite flow at each node that's annotated with a particular term. Um, this is the reservoir of, of annotation for term A uh, times zero uh, and zero value otherwise. And then you kind of let it propagate over time <laughs> um, <laughs> where basically you're looking at the flow into and out of each node, so the difference between the flow into and out of the node, and you update it <laughs> uh, so that the fact that there are three of these guys, they still have to kind of go through this bottleneck, and that restricts how much of the flow can get down to each of these guys. Um, and that does a really nice job of function prediction uh, as well. And beyond that, <laughs> um, I mean, so there, there are a number of flow-related methods. But that's starting to look at more about the, the local network structure of the graph, right? So now I'm saying not just who's in my neighborhood, but how am I connected to who's in my neighborhood? And ultimately, when we're looking at these questions of, of protein function prediction, we want to look at the structure of who's in the neighborhood, and we want to look at the community structure of the graph in general, right? So a lot of the graphs that we're dealing with have a sort of hierarchical community structure. Um, <laughs> there may be little clusters, and then they're clustered into bigger clusters. 
or what we're going to call modules, and Rodette is going to talk a fair bit later today about how you use modules <laughs> or how you find modules in a graph, and modules are, are inherently used in function prediction. Um, right, so if you're part of the same module, then you're more likely to have functions that belong to people in your module, basically. So what else can you do to solve these problems? I just want to touch on a couple of the <coughs> other broad methods that, that people have used. Um, Right. So one of them is, we've been talking about network neighborhoods of distance one or two or three. <laughs> Maybe that's the wrong measure of distance. Right? And this is something that Ben alluded to and people have talked about a little bit earlier in the week. But right, here's the, the, distance, the shortest path distance between pairs of nodes in a typical protein interaction graph. And what you'll see is that there are small numbers of log scale as well, I think. Or no, it's just it's not log scale. Um, but it's, it's a tiny fraction of the number of nodes or edges. But <laughs> what you'll see is that there are very, a, a small number of things that are direct neighbors, a huge number of things at distance two, a huge number of things at distance three, and most things are within three hops. Right? And then there's a little bit of a tail. Um, <laughs> so distance isn't really, t the, 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 that measure of distance, a number of edges connecting me is a poor measure of how likely I am to have your function, <laughs> right? And the way to see this is this concept of, um, <laughs> you know, predicting whether there's an edge between nodes A and B in this graph. So suppose this is a social network graph. This is my Facebook friends graph, right? And suppose that this hub over here is Beyonce. Right? The fact that A and B both are connected to Beyonce tells me really nothing whatsoever about whether the two of them have anything else in common. Right? It's, you know, everybody's friends with everybody. Who cares? Um, <laughs> it's not informative. Right? But if I have a graph like this, where they're only connected through somebody who doesn't have a lot of other connections, then actually it's much more likely that A and B are really neighbors. And, really, and you know, for function prediction, right, just change being neighbors to function prediction, right? So these guys, you know, if you have a hub in common, you might belong to a complex where you're all doing the same thing, or you might be just interacting with some regulatory protein that has a lot of different connections under different circumstances. And so transferring that annotation is a little bit dicey. Um, so one thing you can do is you can redefine <laughs> distance in a network uh, to be some sort of diffusion-based distance. So you could look at random walk properties, right? Your expected time for a random walk to get from here to here, right? If it's, you know, with 50% probability you do it in two hops, with 50% probability you go back and you come back and again, so a quarter of the time you'll do it in four, right? So your, your expected random walk is actually going to take four hops or something. <laughs> your expected time to get from here to here you know, most of the time you're going to be bouncing around all over this graph before you get here. So it's much, much further. So if you redefine distance in a way that captures random walk time or hitting time or diffusion or some measure of this, um, you improve almost all the distance-based protein function prediction methods <laughs> because you're able to make distinctions between these guys of degree two. And it doesn't mean degree two anymore. So that's one of the things that we can do to help <laughs> the process along. Um, <coughs> another. Uh, uh, just divide by the degree of the, uh, the point. Let's say if H has a big degree, we'll divide the edge by this degree or something. Is that, is that <coughs> the equivalent to some kind of um, it's not equivalent because it doesn't capture longer distance structures. But yes, in, I mean for for maybe for the hub. Example, it'll be close, but for larger structures, it isn't. <laughs> so it's close. Um, but you actually have to do something a little more than that. <laughs> right? So the other thing you can do is you can change what you're trying to predict. Right? So instead of saying, I want to predict exactly that, you know, I have this gene ontology term or that gene ontology term, maybe you can just look for particular kinds of functions and then you can do it in a different way. Right? So one of the things we looked at was um, <laughs> looking at hubs and whether they have regulatory roles. And it turns out if you look at their network neighborhood, 
basically if they're highly, you know, if they have high connectivity or it's something, it's, it's not exactly the same as clustering coefficient, but it's similar. But, th but there's some differences as well um, from clustering coefficient. But if my network neighborhood is most likely very well strongly connected, I'm probably part of a complex of things that's doing one particular function. Whereas if it disconnects in an easy way, I'm more likely to be doing different things in different times. And the catch to all of this is that these are really these are really essentially random graphs with different probabilities on each edge, but they're not the same probability. So you can't, all of the great beautiful graph theory about like Erdős random graphs goes out the window. And it's um, an open problem for anybody who cares about this sort of thing is could you come up with the expected number of connected components in a random graph with arbitrary probability distributions over the, over the <laughs> um, individual edges? Right, I think this is a hard problem. I th I, maybe a better way of putting it is, could you prove a hardness result about that? Because <laughs> um, I think it is hard. Uh, but so we were able to do some probabilistic things to say that you know if it's likely a disconnected graph, then that that gets regulatory function. Right. So <laughs> you could also try. Um, you could also try to predict. Uh, <laughs> You know, if you're just if you're going to be a hub protein or if you're going to have a particular hub function, right? So then we get into this question that you raised earlier that maybe I should have put in the earlier talk about: Are these things scale free, right? And so there's definitely a lot of bits of data that say, well, okay, <laughs> you know, if I'm if I'm a hub, I'm more likely to be essential and I'm more likely to be lethal and I'm more likely to have functional annotations just like that are related to those, right? Some function that is an essential function. Um, so the early networks look like they're scale free, um, but there are a number of people out there who argue that a lot of the scale free appearance of what we see in the protein interaction databases is due in part to the fact that we're missing a lot of data and we're very biased on what we have. Right, so it's not really clear if the underlying network is scale free or if just the data that we've collected so far are scale free. Um, and you can, I, I'm gonna, try to avoid weighing in too heavily on who's right on this because I'm still not really sure. But <laughs> there are some compelling arguments that, you know, certainly some of the individual data sets and some collection of the data don't fit this model very well. Um, right, and so that gets back to this sort of whole question of centrality and, and lethality or essentiality. <laughs> right, if I'm, an, if I'm a central hub protein and you knock me out, then I ought to do a lot of damage. And so we clearly have some hub proteins, right? I mean, the degree distribution is such that even if we're undersampling, we clearly do have a long tail of things that have very high degree. Um, whether it fits the linear model is not clear, but it, it, there certainly are some hubs, right? So the original results said, well, central hub, there, there are hub proteins and there are essential proteins. And then some people came back and said, actually, you know what? Maybe not in our data set, but what's really happening is that degree is com correlated with whether you do a whole lot of different functions. And so we're starting to see, you know, we, that explains a lot of the centrality and essentiality results that we saw so far. And then people argued further, well, actually, really what we're seeing with, this, with the centrality lethality data is that we're seeing complexes. Right? And if something is connected, if something is hubby, it's probably part of a big complex. If it's part of a big complex, it's either highly enriched for being essential or highly depleted for being essential, depending on what it does. And we're throwing all that data together, and we're not teasing it out, and we're getting this picture that centrality is, makes you essential. Um, but it's really not. Right? So <laughs> I think what I want to, pretty close to time, what I think I want you to take away with this from this is that <laughs> There's a lot from protein interaction networks that we can do to really learn more about protein function, both in very specific and very, in more general ways. Um, but it's not always simple, right? So you get these nice centrality lethality rules and these pretty power law graphs, and then you start to say, wait a minute, you know, we're not really looking at the whole picture. What, what happens if we look at more of it? Um, so modeling what we're missing is an important area that people could be working in. Um, basically, it's important to understand where the data are coming from. And that's why I spent some time talking about use to hybrid and methods, is that you need to know where the data are coming from in order to be able to build realistic models. Um, 
<laughs> coming up with good computational models of the noise is often hard, but at least understanding what it is so that you can say, okay, I'm not, these are the parts of my model that I think are, are an oversimplification, but I can still get something useful out of it with this, I think is probably the way to, to make the most impact uh, in a reasonable way. So I think I'm going to leave that here and take questions. Questions or has the coffee worn off? Perhaps I do have a question. So, so uh, you mentioned before talking of uh, how you use the graph for the function operation, you mentioned how you, you predict the edges, so how you, you can detect interactions. But what about once you have the graph, uh, what about you know um, predicting missing links? Are there many methods based on the graph itself to say, well, here there seems to be a missing link? Yeah, that would be another talk, but <laughs> I mean, there's a, no, there are a lot of. <laughs> Um, approaches for people who have looked at ways of predicting missing links. Some of them structure, graph structure based. <laughs> Many of them, um, you know, based on on like protein structure or, pro or protein sequence and attempts at predicting protein structure. So yes, there are lots of computational methods. Uh, I can point you towards a review that one of my students wrote of this stuff, but you know there are, that was a few years ago, so it's probably been there's probably been more since then. Um, yes, <laughs> yes. So predicting protein-protein interactions is a common area. I think it's less exciting now because the actual experimental data is growing enough that maybe that's less essential. Um, <laughs> but you know, yes, we do. I mean, we talked a little about doing prediction from some of the other tools, right? And so there has been some uh, efforts to estimate uh, the false positive and the false negative. There have been a lot <laughs> of efforts. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. The problem with all of the efforts to estimate the false positive and negative rates of particular experiment, you know, data sets usually. Somebody's new yeast to hybrid data set comes out and then somebody else. What, what tends to be happening is that labs are fighting over your data are bad, your data are worse, your data, right? So there's a lot, of, I don't know how much of it I believe because of the, you know, the, the sort of, tennis match thing that's going on in there about people trying to hit each other with stuff. Um, but there have definitely been methods made to assess data sets compared to other data sets and see which ones are more reliable or which ones are less reliable. And I think basically what's happening is over time we're getting better at this, right? So the newer stuff is tending to be you know, we're, we're starting to fix some of the bugs and we're getting more reliable as, as we come out. And I can't even begin to talk about the, the 15 new technologies that people have started to use that mostly they're not using on as huge a scale, but some of them are starting to scale up. Um, so there's this BioCore method that uses some kind of resonance image. I, I don't really understand how it works, so I'm not gonna go through it. Yeah, but there are a bunch of technologies that are coming online and so again I think once people get them ready for prime time we're going to start seeing you know newer larger data sets from other sources um, but I really think it's a it's a temporal thing so I think I, I read somewhere that uh, we probably have by now the majority of the interactions in yeast in yeast we probably do in human I don't think we're close <laughs> right because of co context right I'm sorry, did you have it? Yeah, um, I wanted to ask about patient specific AI. What are the estimates? Different yeah, that's an interesting question, right? So <laughs> I would rather call it context specific PPI um, <laughs> in the sense that, I mean, I don't know of a lot of people doing specific experiments with, I guess you could take tumor cells from a patient or something and try to characterize that. <laughs> um, Although again, there I think you'd have a hard time teasing out what's causative and what's a downstream effect of general, you know, chromosomal dysregulation and cellular dysregulation. 
Um, but but so it, I think patient-specific protein interactions are an interesting concept. I would rather say, can you look at a common context and do this? And this is exactly why, Ron, I don't think we have most of the graph for human, um, which is that there are so many contexts, right? Yeast has, you know, I mean, there are, there are a bunch of things you can do to yeast, but it's one cell, <laughs> right? So you're not looking at you know, different tissues and different organisms and respond. And most of the time, you know, there's a happy yeast phenotype and an unhappy yeast phenotype. And all of the nasty things you can do to it are variations on that unhappy yeast phenotype. So it's much simpler. And I think with, with humans or even, you know, other multicellular organisms, it, it gets much more complicated much more quickly. And I don't think we've captured all of the kinds of context, the developmental context, the, you know, dysregulated context or disease states that we would want to capture. So I would love to see more of that. It's <laughs> definitely something that, you know, people have looked a little bit at individual relationships in certain contexts, more, more I think, regulatory than, than protein interaction ones. But um, that's, that's a place where we need a lot more technological development. And that's a place where prediction of interactions may be <coughs> useful. So not just, is this interaction a possibility, but when is it a possibility? Why is it a possibility? Right? But that in itself is a protein function prediction, really. So you know, it's a piece of the puzzle, but it's, it's not. I think that's an, an area that's not very well populated yet. I was wondering uh, how much uh, the data regarding the specific interaction site is included in this uh, like network models. I mean, the data regarding the specific interaction what? Site. I mean, the, the of the site of the protein. Yeah. yeah. Just about none, <laughs> right? So basically, none of the stuff I've talked about today is dealing with <laughs> physically or chemically. How is that interaction happening with this part of this molecule? So that is, there is work looking at this. It's really more structure-based, right? But um, and and some of the attempts to predict, like interlogs, can use okay, are these particular sites really? But it's it's pretty bit, it's been pretty minimal. I think there's room for more going on in there. All right, I think we'll okay. just stop here. Right. And so we'll start again at 1.30 for the total product. You can thank the speaker again.